Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk back again with you guys for another episode of the Eat Sleep Arsenal Repeat podcast. Uh, it's just myself and the doc today. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to say that Sophie and Owen are off doing loads of exercise uh, and therefore they can't make the uh, the podcast this week, but they're not. They're very much enjoying themselves uh, in, in England. I mean, Owen has now returned to Ireland, but he's uh, got in at 4.30 a.m. So I think he's asleep right now. Uh, and Sophie's still very much enjoying herself in the UK as well. But Doc, I'm very happy to be joined by you, of course. How are you doing? You good? You're well? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm quite well. Not a uh, hungover like Soph and Owen from the from the win, I imagine. So, mm. yeah, I, I met a couple of people for the first time um, on on Monday, and they'd all been to the game. And for some of them, that was their first Arsenal game they'd ever been to. Mm-hmm. So as games go, pretty darn lucky um, mm-hmm. to, to get that one. So very happy indeed for them uh, that they managed to get uh, involved in that and watch that as their first game because it could, probably couldn't have been any better in terms of experiencing football in the flesh. Have, have you been over to watch a game yet, right? I, I, I haven't been, not to Emirates at least. So mm. uh, it's, been, it's been a while. It's been a while. That's for certain. Yeah, you'll have to get over at some point and uh, yeah, hopefully we man. can get to a game together. That'd be very good indeed. Um, as, of course, it is just me and the doc, it's going to be a slightly different and slightly shorter show today. Uh, and, of course, what we usually do at the end of our podcast is we have a questions for the doc section. And what I thought we would do this time around is extend that section a little bit and then open it up to the floor as well. So we've put a tweet out on the Twitter sphere. You can find us uh, at the Google Talk TV and at, of course, 3CB Performance as well. Um, and we're going to go through some of those questions. But to kick things off, we have to talk about Manchester United because it was a absolutely brilliant victory um, and a hard-fought one. What did you make of the game? Yeah, firstly, I thought, you know, it kind of reminded me of the old United Arsenal games in terms of atmosphere, right? I mean, it was even watching it on, on TV, not being there. I can't imagine how it was being there. But the mm. atmosphere uh, seemed to be, you know, and it was incredible. Even more, of course, after City had won within two points, even though the game in hand, but still, there's still that pressure there. I mean, honestly, overall, even though with the team going down, you know, off Rashford's great, great shot, it was one of those games I never really felt quite nervous about it Mm. just because of how the game was going. I mean, they didn't, United didn't really create anything out of, you know, outside of of our own mistakes. It was almost like the Tottenham game in the first half in that regard. Um, more competitive than that, of course. But even after the team went down, I mean, you tip your cap to Rashford. That was, he's incredible form mm-hmm. right now. But the way we were playing, I knew we would respond. And and then, we, you know, we went off from there. Second half was, second half was just, pure, you know, pure control, pure domination. And almost like how Tottenham was last week in the first half. But I, I didn't. I wasn't really outside of Rashford, you know, playing whose whose runs off back off the back shoulder are incredible, and some of Bruno Bruno's ability to find pockets in mm-hmm. the final third. Nothing really stood out as to me as like you know being all that dangerous. Maybe part of it was the fact that with Juan Bissaka, who's great, obviously one we one v one defensively compared to Dallo, but. He, like it kind of negates that right hand side for them as well compared mm. to him. So n- n- never really under threat. The last ten minutes, obviously they were under siege and it ended in that uh, and Ketia, I think a much deserved goal. So yeah, to me, I mean the score line. I mean the the, the goals they scored. Rashford, Lestandro's looping header after Ramsdale drops what well, would have been a catch, but then he ran to Tomiyasu right. So. I had the Lysander goal. You're like, man, like, you know, not this, like, you know, scoring like that, but then of course mm. you went up, but otherwise, yeah, comfortable game to me overall. I think the XG shows that of course XG is not the end all be all, but I thought we create created patterns of play. They couldn't handle us touches in the box. Soccer was incredible, of course. So, um, you know, yeah, a great game. Yeah, it was a great game. Um, if that's your first introduction to football, you know, it's you've probably hit a peak and everything is never going to be the same as that because it was just so good. Um, it had everything, really, you know, the last-minute winner, a back and forth, um, conceding, turning things around, eventually winning it, you know, and there was mistakes. You're right, Partey made the error, obviously, that led to, to Rashford's goal. We had the error from Ramsdale with the corner that led to Martinez's goal. 
But all of our goals were really well crafted. Yes, there were some defensive questions of wan in particular or on two occasions. Uh, and of course, you'd have to argue maybe not closing down Saka for his strike. But all the goals we scored were brilliantly crafted um, and, and, you know, did the business for us in the end of getting us to three points. It's massive because it, it probably kicks them out completely of any title ambitions that they may have had. Uh, it obviously pushes us further away from Man City with a game in hand that we can still go three points clear. That game is, is I believe, at home to Everton. So you'd imagine that that game we would win. And we still have the two games, of course, to play City. And what's really funny about that and that dynamic, I find, Raj, is that people are saying, well, Arsenal have got to play City twice. You know, I was listening to the Arscast today and I think it was James that said... Um, Actually, the way you should look at it is City have got to go to Arsenal. Uh, and, you know, that that in itself is a really tough prospect for them. And we've got the game on Friday. I'm actually going to be going to the Etihad for that game. I'm working it. And um, it, it's a really interesting fixture, I think, because how you balance rotation for a cup competition and then not giving away too much for the fixture in the Premier League just a couple of weeks later. How How would you go about kind of selecting a side for this one? Yeah, it's so tough. This one's really, really tough to me. Um, I think I think the easiest one for me is to get Trossard into the starting lineup, mm-hmm. right? To let him adapt a little bit more and, and maybe give Martinelli a little bit uh, of a, a rest or, you know, just some time off for himself. I think that's the easiest rotation. We've seen, I think Saliba did some rest as well a few times. Mm-hmm. And so I think potentially holding coming in there as well. I wonder... I have a question uh, a right back as well with Ben White, whether for him it was a yellow card thing or if it was just a fatigue. I mean, he he had an off. His first half was maybe the most off he's been potentially all season, right? Maybe it was – I think part of it was due to the yellow card versus Rashford. Of course, you don't want to go in again. He's, and he stopped going to challenges after that. But he was also misplacing some passes, and he's usually very, very composed. So potentially giving him a little bit of a break as well. And allowing Tomiyasu to keep playing, I think, could be a possibility there as well. I think you bring Tyranny in for Zinchenko, potentially. Mm. I think, tactically wise, that's probably the biggest change you can make to me. Because one, you give Zinchenko a little bit of time off, been dealing with some soft tissue injuries, right? But when Zin is in there, completely mm. different team because his ability to invert, right? I don't know how much you want to give away with that and allow City to adapt to that before you see them in a Premier League game. So I, I think you will – I think that, to me, would be the clearest substitution. You want Tierney to play as well, right? So that's another, another thing I would uh, think about as well. I mean, mm-hmm. the right win equation is, is always a question because the drop-off from Saka to anyone else is arguably, to me, other than maybe Partey, is the biggest drop-off. Right. And I think now well, that brings me to the next point with El Nini potentially being out is what do you do with the central midfield? Right. Do you give Partey a rest who has been rested? So I think that's going to be a question. Do you bring Lakanga on potentially, although he struggled in that lone six role, which is a very hard position to play for anyone, Whoa. let alone someone who's still adapting. So definitely some question marks, not question marks, but definitely some really interesting decisions to be made. And like you said, the added layer is not giving away too much for what is, you know, I think for, from Arsenal's perspective, their main priority, which is winning the league, right? So yeah, uh, really, really, really interesting there. Yeah, it's going to be a very intriguing game. I'm hoping it's worth the journey, the long journey up to Manchester on Friday. Um, it probably means, by the way, guys listening, that there won't be a live 8 a.m. show on the Saturday um, because I'll be travelling back. Uh, what I'm going to try and do, though, is record my reaction to the game on this on this Friday night and then upload that for 8am the following day. So there will be some piece of content. It just won't be the usual live show. Uh, and you know, I'm also not going to be able to do an 8am show on deadline day, believe it or not, because I'm going to be working from 6am through to 4pm on deadline day. So I, it's it, believe it or not, that's the nice shift for deadline day. You don't want to be doing 12-12. Believe me, that oh. is... Or two or two twelve. It is a uh, is a challenging shift to to do, and I've done it before. So I'm glad I've got the early one. It means that I don't have to do with all the chaos that could happen towards the deadline. Um, but no, we'll cross that bridge when it comes. Um, as will Arsenal, of course, with these games that they've got coming up. Um, 
I want to get your thoughts as well, just before we go to questions on transfers as well, because obviously we've seen some movement since our last podcast. It's amazing what can happen in the space of a week. We've signed two players. Uh, Leandro Trossard has obviously come in, made his debut against Manchester United. And we've also signed a uh, left-sided centre-back, Jakob Kivior, as well from Spezia. What have you made of the two deals that we've done? I think Trossard deal made so much sense, right? It was very opportunistic signing. He had fallen out uh, with Brighton. And, you know, he's a player who offers, I think, a, a profile one where he can, hit, he can hit the ground running. I think we saw it, a, a small sample size, of course. But you saw the fact that he's been there before and the way that he was able to maintain possession, composure. He plays that first pass to Zinchenko, which then goes to Enketia, right? So you already see where he fits in quite quickly because his IQ, positional versatility, everything checks the box with, box mm. with him in that regard. And so I think it was a great signing and very, very motivated to kind of show, I think the fact that maybe he'd fallen out of Brighton, he's now more motivated to show the player that he was. I think there's been a bit of an underrating on that signing because it recency bias. He's a guy when you watch him with Brighton, especially when he was playing with Cucurella on the left-hand side with a player of a high caliber around him, he plays, he interchanges really, really well with those types of players and Arsenal are filled with those players. Right. And so I think it'll be a really good signing in that regard. And his playing style is a little different than Martinelli where Martinelli is a little bit more kind of, you know, likes to pause on the ball, use his pace. Trissard is much more about his angles. He's a little bit more direct as well. So him coming off the bench for a defender after facing Martinelli for 65, 70 minutes, now you're faced with a, a different, type of question that you have to adapt to on the fly. And I think that just changes. It makes it a lot harder for, for defenders because you can't, you have to adapt in game and it's never easy to do that. And I think, I think that's a, a great signing. And then um, next signing with Kivior. I mean, that's a great, I think left back, excuse me, not left back, left center back has been yeah. a, a, a position. You can play left back to be fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he can play, honestly, he can play anywhere across the yeah. back line. I think profile-wise, again, makes a lot of sense. High IQ, versatile player, left-footed, left center back, which has been a position of need behind you know, Gabriel. And so, and I think, you know, there's plenty of comps out there. You can see just how good that left foot and that distribution is of his, yeah. right? And so, uh, a great signing, very shrewd signing, one that happened quite quickly as well. And so, again, you know, these the, the profiles all – make sense and they're starting to you know to reinforce and potentially another i don't know if it's you know you've with uh what's the name fresnetta fresnetta, fresnetta. Yeah. yeah yeah again same profile young very high iq can play all across the line we don't know i mean on twitter you hear back and forth you know arsenal Dortmund, who's in lead doesn't really matter <laughs> honestly i've never seen a, a transfer story covered where Someone says Arsenal in front. Someone else says Dortmund in front, and someone else says Arsenal. I've never seen it. Yeah, quite like so, that. yeah. Who knows what's going on there? I don't even. I don't get hung up on that anymore. And so, just wait till it happens. And so, but again, the profiles all are all making sense a, as well. I think center mid is a position we'll see addressed mm -hmm. in the summer, whether it's Declan Rice, which has been linked or not. They clearly want a center midfielder with with a drop in level where you're able to sustain. The current level right especially for next season where arsenal very likely almost assuredly now will be champions league right they're going to be playing across five competitions at a high level so and that's that's more of a, a summer move but yeah again all all the all the approach makes a lot of sense and it's been it's been a great pivot after missing out on mudrick right they've they've worked really really quickly to find their players and i think part of that i think Part of that, I think there's a lot of question marks about that after last winter, but I think part of that is now players are more willing to come because you're seeing an Arsenal team, obviously, that is where you're seeing the project becoming a lot more clear for people who may not have been paying attention, right? And so it's gonna it's gonna be a lot more appealing for players, and of course you have the prospect of Champions League football as well. So uh, it's, it's been. A really good January window, all things considered. Yeah, I, I think that we are on on track, especially if we can get one or you know even two if this Fresneda deal uh, is done. And I say one or two more because I'd like it to be a midfielder. 
Uh, I've seen rather something rather funny actually pop up on my Twitter just now. Um, we've obviously been linked with Weston McKenney, who I'm sure you'll know yep. more about playing the US men's national team. Um, someone tweeted saying McKenney is nowhere near close to being technically good enough for Arteta's side. He doesn't have the creative passing IQ or the positional IQ. I think uh, Yunus Musa is a better American to sign if they want depth for Xhaka's position. McKenney's dad replied to the tweet. Um, saying, really? Yeah, saying, what are you smoking? Can I get some? <laughs> um, which is, you know, if, if this if this window couldn't have taken a more social media turn off the whole Mudrick situation, and I think Kamavinga was even seen liking a post about Arsenal uh, Arsenal's interest. So a player's dad's getting involved in it's just oh, like man. the next level Goodness. for this. Uh, what a window. It's this is good. I, I, I think part of it with the art, I mean, the Arsenal fan base on social media is just so active. Mm. And I think that's part of why you see guys. I mean, that's why, you, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff we hear about the Arsenal celebration police, Neville nonsense, you know, United's going to finish above them. Yeah. A, a lot of it is done intentionally because they know it's in a get all these retweets and people quote tweeting because the Arsenal fan base just has to get after it. So I take it all with a, it's just, it's funny to me. And, and now Arsenal coming in to steal potentially, you know, Caicedo from Chelsea. Yeah, it's just it's like, all right, man, like it it's funny happens. how things turn so quickly. It just cracks me up. To be fair. Um, and we're going to go on to questions. It's quite a nice segue because the first question uh, from at Z froggy at ZD froggy on Twitter, Fraser said, Raj, please tell us your thoughts on one. Mr. Richard keys. Uh, I'll be a good 15 minute watch. I mean, again, another character that's there just plastered his rubbish all over social media. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, pretty much what I just said, right. He just, mm. it's just looking for clicks, looking for engagement. I don't mm. even try to give them any attention because I personally, the more you, the more you quote tweet, the more you retweet, that's all they care. That's all they're looking for is engagement. Yeah. So if you take away that fuel, it's going to reduce what they do. So I don't even want, I just, I honestly, when I see it, the most I'll comment, I just laugh. Just like, you know, it's so transparent to me. It is. It is very funny indeed. Um, we have got a few more questions regarding uh, kind of the, the football aspect of the game, and then we've got some more uh, doc type questions. Um, sure. So we'll go for the footbally ones first. In the Discord server, uh, Dan Roberts says, with uh, Gabriel Jesus saying that he'll be back in four to five weeks, what does this kind of even mean? I don't know if you saw this. Um, I did. But, yeah, the, he did. Uh, he was chatting with Khabib Namegdamedov yeah. um, yeah. of the UFC, and he was kind of videoed saying maybe four or five weeks, and then we'll come back. I, I reckon Arsenal are going to be a bit annoyed that that um, has probably come out and that that's been videoed because, of course, that is just him speaking. There's no yeah. evidence, no something to support that. Uh, Arteta has been very secretive about it. We've seen him using the ball, you know, inside. He's not seen him doing ball work properly, just kind of doing some keepy up. We've seen that he's not on crutches anymore. We've seen that he's done... Um, I, I don't think he's done any running at the moment, but he certainly has been doing some strength rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So what did you make of, of that reaction? I mean, yeah, I mean, what I was, I, I caution against it, caution to take too much into it, because even though, you know, they, they might've told him that a month of rehab, there's still, it, that's not, there's no guarantee, right? You still have to go the day to day, progress, see how the person responds, especially as he gets back to more intense training. We haven't even seen him do like side to side movement or running yet. So I think that's a very, you know, general timeline, but it's hard to project anything out that far. Like we've seen multiple times, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, Liverpool, right? Luis Diaz got back to team training and then has a re-injury on the same knee. Mm -hmm. He's out for two months. Uh, Reese James came back for one game has a re-injury on that knee. So like that shift from just, you know, strength to work, even running and lateral movement to actual team training and then the games comes with inherent risk. Mm. So I always, that's why I always say, I always reiterate, like it's all about how he's responding. It's all about how he's progressing. And I think that's why Mikel also doesn't want to, Mikel and the medical, medical team, excuse me, doesn't want to put a timeline on it because it's all about, day to day, day to day. And, and, you know, Arteta say, Arteta says like, you know, I focus training to training. It's not even about looking out four to five weeks. And I think the medical team very much has taken on that same mentality, at least, you know, publicly just focusing on the day to day progression. And so, yeah, I don't think they'll be that all that happy about that four to five week 
timeline coming out because it puts an expectation yeah. that it's not necessary. And then, you you know, if something happens now, it becomes this, oh, the metal team messed up or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, good to hear. I think that the positive, at least, is that he hasn't had any setbacks and he's progressing. And I think that's the most you can take out of it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that... You know, it's, what's, like, what's funny is that if he comes back, say, tomorrow, he doesn't get in the team. <laughs> like, you know, he doesn't get, even get back in the side at the moment, which right. is kind of – it's great. That's great. You know, that's, that's what we wanted because – and I wrote a piece today, actually, on Football London about the – oh, you'll be yesterday by the time this comes out – but um, about how, actually, Arsenal already have their £45 million Saka competitor because I think that Jesus, can, his versatility – can actually give us some competition with Saka and say, if you want to give Saka a rest, you don't have to drop Nketiah because you can bring Jesus in on the right-hand side. And I think yeah. that he can absolutely play that position. So, yes, we've brought in another left-sided play, even though we have Smith Rowe and Martinelli that can already play there and Nketiah can play there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think that Jesus' return doesn't necessarily mean you have to swap out Nketiah for the Champions League games. If we progress in the, if, uh, sorry, the Europa League games, I'm getting ahead of myself with Champions League football. But um, with the FA Cup games, of course, as well, you know, Jesus could potentially come in on the right and you could sub off Saka. You know, at the moment, we're not subbing off Saka at all in games, really. You know, so you've got an option there to, to if you want to bring Saka off, give him a bit of a rest if you are leading a game or maybe you want to change things up a bit. So, yeah, there are options for us going forward, and that's good. Um, let's uh, let's take another question. Um, Danny at NAF Tracks on Twitter says, uh, ask the doc if he thinks it's a good tactic from the Arsenal to be so coy about injuries. They've stopped releasing those injury update articles, and we have four players out injured right now, and we don't even know what specific injuries two of them have in Elneny and Cedric. I can tell you that Elneny's is a knee issue, from what I understand. I don't know what Cedric's is, although I think that could be related to the transfer situation. And there's no timelines. I, I didn't even think about the fact that they've stopped doing those those injury updates. Because I remember they used to just release them. You have the name in bold and then kind of what the timeline is of those back. They have stopped releasing them. What do you make of that? Do you think that they're just trying to be keep people guessing about when they might get players back, opposition sides maybe doing the homework on Arsenal? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think it's just, to me, it's just a continuation of what we've already seen of them not putting timelines on players. And the last timeline I saw was like with Xhaka, they said three months, he came back early. But after that, haven't really seen anything in terms of uh, timelines or updates. And I think part of that is just that the same thing about, I think, you know, you know, keeping things behind closed doors and not putting extra pressure or not having people focus on, you know, two to three mm. weeks ahead and just focusing day to day. So to me, that's really coming from the head of the snake and that day to day focus top to bottom. And, you know, what? I'm not the time. I don't want to. I mean, teams are going to choose. It, it's up to the team and the players to decide mm. what they want, what they want to release. I don't think it's good or bad. So. I don't have any judgment on it, you know, either, either way. I think a lot of times I, we might think we, you know, we, we want to know more, but until I, I don't, I think it just, it makes sense to me why you wouldn't. And I think you've seen that with some, and some managers tend to be like that. Pep is very secretive like that. Right. Um, mm. It just depends on the, the, the manager and the team and how they feel about it. So. Yeah. It's honestly, when you're in one of those press conferences and, you just know, like you know, the type of questions not to ask these days, yeah. um, because if you do ask them, you're just going to get a very typical response of either yeah. we don't talk about transfers, and we've got another training session, and so we'll have to wait and see where things are, you know, regarding the team news. So yeah. uh, it's difficult. I look, I, I have my criticisms of, of Arteta in, in, the, in the press conference. I think it can be a bit too cold at times with answers. Um, there was an, there was a, a question put forward by I think it was someone from Sky, and uh, when she was asking the question, obviously he interrupted her, and then she yeah. said like I've not finished my question. He said I've not finished my answer. You know, I I, I do wish sometimes maybe it could be a little bit more forgiving um, to some of the questions being asked and maybe a bit open. But you know, he's been pretty good when I've asked him questions uh, in the press conferences and I think that will come down to being better with the questions that you come up with so it's certainly something that I need to I know I need to improve is is structurally putting forward questions that are more open to him but yeah I, I think hopefully you will open up more and obviously if say this season goes really well I think that relationship with the media will improve it's just because he's been so criticized for so long 
he's kind of come straight into things and everyone's bashed him. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that relationship maybe has been affected by that. So hopefully it improves. Um, Guna Jake, who has the longest at on Twitter I think I've ever seen, uh, at Jackie27704472. <laughs> that's, that's a ridiculously long one. Um, Jake says, uh, please ask the doc if it is sustainable to play at the levels that we have been until the end of the season without any big injuries, excluding the types of contact injuries that you get? I mean, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard question to answer, mm. right? Because I'm not privy to, you know, the, the data and what they're seeing. I mean, is it possible? Yeah. I, I think what we have to realize is that when Mikel came in, he, one of the things he said is that the fitness levels on the team were not even close. And I think it was either last summer, I think it was last summer where he finally said, yeah, last summer, I believe, maybe this summer, I can't remember, but he was finally saying, yeah, our fitness levels are finally close to where I want them to be, right? So they've built up day by day to this point of having players who can play a lot and quite often. And then the key is also, they now have rotation depth too. And so you're seeing guys come in or being subbed out earlier because they have the depth yeah. behind them, or you have players come in like during uh, Europa league games or cup games, they'll come in for like starters will come in for like 30 minutes and get a little fitness boost. Right. A lot of times what will happen is you want players to have consistent kind of dosage of, um, of fitness. So instead of just doing it now after the game with the players, like you'll see players go through like, um, little fitness sessions if they haven't played, they'll mm-hmm. just have them play in the game for 15, 20 minutes, come in, get that fitness boost. And so some of the methodology that me- methodology there has been changing. And I think that's why you're seeing players who are able to play a lot more consistently because they've raised the baseline mm-hmm. of the fitness standard. Now, of course, th- the question becomes as games become more dense, especially with Europa League starting back up, that's when you kind of start to have a concern about can fatigue how how can you balance out that fatigue and the recovery? And again, that's why Arteta always talks about like after a game. Now we move, now we move on to recovery, right? Yeah. It's, like, it's like every single thing is as important as the other thing, right? And so they've really periodized periodized excuse me kind of mm-hmm. all these facets of who the players are and how to get them going at, at their optimal levels. Is it sustainable in theory? Yes. Right. Um, will it happen? I, I, I don't know. I can't yeah. say that, but I'll, I'll say uh, the team is much, is much closer to doing that now than they've ever been before. Mm. The, the big question I think is going to come next season. If, and when we get champions league football, that you need to put out a competitive 11 twice a week, you know, right. And in part, obviously, a lot of that is by strengthening the team through transfers and moving on some of the players that aren't necessarily going to be good enough to rotate each week. And I think we know we've got a fair few of those still at the club. You think of Sambi Lukonga, for instance, Nuno Tavares when he comes back, Pepe, Maitland-Niles, you know, uh, Rob Holding to a lesser extent. Although, I, you know, I like Rob Holding and I think that he offers something in the last few minutes of a game. But if you're in the Champions League and you're going to rotate out Saliba, it's quite a drop down to say, stylistically anyway, to, to Rob Holding. So not that Rob Holding's a bad defender, just that stylistically he doesn't suit what Arteta is asking from a right-sided centre-back at the moment that we get from Saliba with the pace, the progression uh, and, and the composure that we get from him. So we need to work out a system whereby we're going to get, I think you get that in Ben White playing there who can also rotate. That'll come from us maybe bringing in another right-back, which we're after for his neighbor, as we've talked about. So there is a lot of things that could still change with the squad. Squad, but yeah, fitness-wise, a lot of it is luck. You know, you need to be lucky um, and uh, and hope that nothing goes wrong in these moments. Uh, moving away more towards uh, some more health stuff, um, we've got a question from Peeny Ween, who says, uh, who's at Peeny Ween one, uh, do you think the concussion protocols are sufficient in the Premier League at the moment? Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> and so uh, long answer is because you, you, you can't do a valid concussion test in the way that it's currently implemented typically Mm. you need 10 minutes in a dark quiet environment that is literally the opposite opposite. (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty much pressure-free environment that's the exact opposite of what you get on the pitch that being said like there's a lot of pressure on medical staffs too it's not as simple as you know your independent 
uh, neurologist like the NFL has now. And even they have question marks if you yeah. followed it, right? Even that, uh, like Tua Tagovailoa Tiger, Tiger for the Dolphins has had multiple concussions and there's been a whole thing there. And that's with independent neurologists. So, yeah, so no. I think a big thing that needs to be looked at, temporary substitutions to allow for that to happen. Yeah. But yeah. again, let's say, right, you're in a title chase. Let's say it's Arsenal. So he yeah. has a head knock. Right. And you have 15 minutes left in the game. You're going to say, you know, let's, I, I don't know yeah. who's going to say, let's not risk it. In that moment, it's yeah. so easy to say, all right, well, you know, we'll deal with it afterwards. But what if something, you know, does happen? What if he gets another head injury? Yeah. And you have, you know, a, a double trauma there. And so call it secondary impact syndrome. So, which can potentially be lethal. So, it's so hard in the moment. But, you know, the protocols need to be, they need to be better. I think rugby, if you follow rugby, they, they're doing a much better job of it than the Premier League is. Yeah, uh, I was at a rugby game recently, um, Bristol Tigers against, Le uh, sorry, Bristol Bristol City against Leicester Tigers is what I went to. And um, there was a, the referee just, when there was a head injury, just told the player to go off. He went into the, the stadium and they did a full check on him before he was allowed to return. Um it is easier in rugby, you know, because the positions are different and the squads mm -hmm. are different and uh, they're very specific positions for the roles that they do. So you usually have an easy substitute to bring in. Um, in football, everything's so tactical that you can use these things to your advantage. Things can, you know, you can exploit different rulings as well. You know, the concussion sub in itself, you know, gives yourself another substitution. If you've run out of subs or you needed someone to go down and feign a head injury, and you can get yourself another substitution. Um, it's, I, I, mean, I suppose, there's a third party doctor, I think, that does the the, um, the assessment, but it opens things up for exploitation, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, you even see it right now with the, the head injury rule with the stoppage, right? If you have a team under pressure, suddenly someone gets hit on like, you know, near the head and they're yeah. going down. And what happens? Or if you're De Gea and you get like a little slap on the wrist and you go down like, oh no. It, somehow it reverberated completely to his brainstem. Yeah. And so I don't know. Yeah. So like, you've seen people abuse that, right? So yeah, yeah absolutely. So, I mean, there's always room for abuse, but I think you have to look at the risk reward. Are the, you know, is, is the potential risk worth the downside of, of, of potential abuse of the rule, right? I mean, that's a key thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we've seen, I heard pushback when the five sub rule came into place. I think that's been great for football, right? I think it adds another layer of strategy as well. I think it allows you to do a much better job what we just talked about with the substitutions and allowing players to have some of those fitness games as well, right? So I think at some point we got we got to move forward a little bit with some of the the head trauma rules. Yeah, absolutely. Um the, this is an interesting question, although it may require you to have some secondary information. So feel free to shut it down. Uh, Mark O'Connor says, at Marcus underscore Maximus underscore, how in-depth are transfer medicals, particularly on deadline day? Very rarely does anyone ever fail a medical. So are they really a check in the box that the player isn't currently carrying an injury more than an assessment of risk with the transfer being long term? Yeah, so a lot of times I, mean, I can't, I don't want to give too much away, but uh, a lot of the, a lot of times the, the medical stuff will happen even before the player gets there. Mm. You, you, can, you can get transfer of records from other players, right? You can talk to the a lot, especially in the premier league, a lot of the physios, medical teams know each other, right? You run in the same circles. So you can kind of figure out some of the stuff that's going on. Um, a lot of the medical de deadline day stuff will just be kind of, you know, cardiovascular checks and, and stuff of that nature. So a lot of the work is done beforehand. And so, mm. especially if there's a concern, if yeah. there, I mean, if there is a concern and then you can kind of go more into it in detail, but typically that, that happens with, with transfers that are kind of more drawn out. Yeah. I think it's a really good example, actually on the all or nothing documentary when we signed Ramsdale, they do like, they, they show a little bit of insight into the process of, of the medical issues. A lot of Q and a questioning the player about previous injuries. Of course yeah. they could lie, <laughs> you know, because they want the yeah. move. But um, there is a lot of, I think there's a lot of questioning that goes on. I think that Max is right. You know, it is a short space of time. Mark, sorry, is right about it. Like there is a short space of time to decipher things. And, and that's probably why you rarely see players fail medicals. I mean, usually it'll be stuff if like, 
I suppose they'll do the treadmill exercise if something's flagged up from a, yeah. a cardiology point of view, um, or they can't complete an exercise without pain. That's, I mean, they can clearly see the players in pain. They, these are going to be things that get flagged up. But yeah, it's, it's obviously very difficult to know without being in the room when those things go on. Um, moving more away uh, and into more health stuff for the last five minutes or so, um, Leeds Gunner, uh, at Leeds Gunner 1 on Twitter says, are protein drinks really worth it? For years now, I've been just having egg and bacon sandwich after a weight session because I think it's more tasty. But other think, others think I'm missing out. Who's right? Is there an answer? I love the idea of a bacon sandwich after a workout. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's there's a little bit of a misnomer here. This so it's really about in general, if you get your protein from a whole, you know, natural protein source, always gonna be better for you than adding like a protein, you know, ice, you know, a whey protein, which is obviously mm. more manufactured. But really what's more important is your overall protein intake on a daily basis. So if you're not eating enough protein and you need to supplement it with a shake, mm. then it's worth it. But if, it's hard to eat. The If I remember, I can't remember the exact number. I think it's like 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, something like that. Mm. I have to look it up, right, to really maintain or build muscle mass. So if you're tracking it and you need more protein, then it makes sense to use yeah. that protein shake. And typically most people will, it's, it's hard to eat that much protein just from natural sources and it's doable, but, and so in that case is where you can really use the protein shake to help supplement. There's, there's this idea of, you know, of, of a protein timing window, post-workout, pre-workout, the evidence there really isn't all that strong. Mm. So it's really more about what you're eating on a daily basis um, from a protein standpoint. Oh, interesting stuff. Uh, so there you go. Bacon sandwiches after a workout. Never thought we'd be talking about that on the pod. Um, Dominic Shrub at uh, for Harry Sheros twenty three on Twitter says, "I'm doing a hundred mile hike over four days, going over the height of Mount Everest around the Lake District this summer to raise money for the organisations who saved my mini gunner's life with emergency heart surgery." First of all, that's amazing, Dominic. Fair play to you. Um, am I more at risk of injury if I heat my peak condition? months or a week before the event i saw this question on twitter i, I was a little mm. confused by the word by, yeah the wording by peak condition like um uh, let's say i mean i would say ideally if, if that's going to be your you know the most taxing event you what, probably want to be in peak condi condition as you go into it yeah right i would think if you're timing if you're planning out you're kind of you're planning out your, your, your programming. Mm. Um, now, if you're going to be in peak fitness and then you're able to maintain it there, then it's okay. So I, I was just a little bit confused by the question. Yeah, I was confused by it. I wanted right. to ask it just in case you had any light bulb moments, but yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, ideally you want to ramp up yeah. towards that. If that's your biggest kind of your biggest exertion, right? You don't want to go peak and then come back down. Yeah, and it's like with marathons, isn't it? You never do a marathon before the marathon. You do like half marathons, but then obviously on the day. You yeah, you can build up to it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I would say, you know, if you're going to go peak fitness and you're able to maintain it there and it's at a level that still you're able to do that, great. But don't go peak and then come back down and then go back yeah. up because that's what leads to injury risk are these big fluctuations in activity level. Uh, we'll do two more. Um, John Frederick at Onyx underscore Lens on Twitter says, my son plays 11, uh, under 11s football. Uh, he has had a few ankle injuries lately. Is there anything you'd recommend that he could do to strengthen his ankles or special pre-match preparations slash stretches? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, uh, a lot of, it depends on the type of ankle injury. Like if it's an ankle sprain, mm. you really want to work on, on what we call like proprioceptive training, which is a lot of balance work and, and, with strengthening, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do. I mean, hard for me to describe it here, but there's plenty you can do with it, right? And there's a lot of warm-up activities that you should be doing regardless of injuries or not. And so, yeah, short answer, yes. Um, it's hard to, for me to explain. Isn't that the one, like, you know, you get that, like, half bouncy ball thing that you kind of put your foot on and you got to try and – do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, like some, yeah, the BOSU yeah. ball. And, that, and that's part of, like, that's a progression in balance training. I would just mm. start – on one foot 
and see how, how you're able to balance for 30 seconds. You can add movement after that. Then you can change the underlying surface, like you said, with the BOSU ball. Right. Yeah. And so there's plenty of ways to progress it in, in that regard. But yeah, yeah, there is. And there's a, there's a lot of options there to do. A lot of band work you can do for ankles as well. I mean, at, he said he's 11 years old, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's a great age to start really training the off-pitch aspects as well. And so, oh, yeah. which we're seeing, which have significant benefits for kids. I mean, let's be honest, kids are made of glue and magic at that age. Like, you know, so, right. <laughs> so right. it's, uh, it's when you get older, we got to start worrying about stuff. Um, and one more question, I think, um, uh, or maybe we've run out. I think that might actually might be all the ones I had. I don't think I saw any more. Oh, um, there was, oh, there was a, a funny one from our good friend, Mike, who took us to our Chinese restaurant the other day. He said, uh, <laughs> which, which is better for overall sports performance? Is it crispy duck with hoisin sauce or Singapore noodles? <laughs> Whatever has more sodium in it. There you go. I mean, if it's me, I'm picking Singapore noodles every single time. I do love crispy duck, but I'm not a fan of hoisin sauce, to be honest. So, yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, all day long. Sweet chili, put on crispy duck. Love it. So good. 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 So if you can order uh, some prawn toast with, with the uh, the sweet chili sauce, always use that for your duck as well. Anyway, we're going to round things off there. Raj, thank you so much for your time, mate. Tell people where they can find you. You can find me at 3CB Performance, turn on Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, and all social media channels. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. No, pleasure. Thank you for taking uh, the listeners' questions. Thank you, listeners, uh, for submitting them. Hopefully, we've given you as many good answers as we can to them drop a like on the video subscribe if you're new hopefully sophie and i will be back and prepared and rested and ready uh, by next week of course we would have played manchester city for the first time this season by them in the cup and we will be approaching the game against everton so there's gonna be lots to discuss lots to talk about hopefully no injury worries but if there is we'll of course be touching on them in great detail uh, massive thanks again to raj for coming on the show and we will see you again very soon have a great day and as always up the arsenal <laughs>